Hey folks, it's your main man Sabado. Welcome or welcome back to the channel. If you've been here before, welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time, welcome to the community. Uh, this is a channel where we talk all things early retirement and the underpinning is that I don't expect everybody to retire early, but I do expect you to live your best life. And so I had the opportunity to retire at 51. And so I use this as an opportunity to share my story and, and hopes that it'll help inspire you or let you know that certain baby steps may get you to where it is that you want to be. But even if you don't retire, you still have an obligation to yourself to live your best life. So uh, today we have a lot to get to go over. So I want to go ahead and get started on the topic because it's a, it's a meaty topic. Um, I had a question uh, during my last episode and it has to do with healthcare and it's from an individual subscriber named Jack Jackson, four, seven, six, eight. And he, he says, great video. I was wondering if you could go into a little more detail about the long-term healthcare side of retirement, like the options that could possibly be presented, especially since we no longer we will no longer be employed by a company. So, Jack, that's a great question. Um, I was doing a bunch of research uh, since my last video. As soon as I got that question, and I realized that the largest uh, expenses for retirees are healthcare, housing, and lifestyle. So when you look at healthcare even broader, the healthcare industry in America is a $4 trillion industry. And you know, retirement spending is influencing a great deal of that. And it's, it's through things like Medicare, private insurance, long-term care, and then just general out-of-pocket costs. But the regular retiree, and when I say regular, uh, we're all regular, we're all normal, we're all adequate, but the regular retiree is defined as somebody who retires at regular retirement age, 65 or older. So they're eligible for Medicare. And Medicare, uh, they pay, they can expect to spend around 4500 to about $6,000 a year on health care. Um, and again, I, I say, I, I want to give the disclaimer that these are averages. Um, as my kindergarten teacher told me, no list covers everything. But in anybody that knows anything about averages, is averages are... Uh, impacted by the extremes. So there's people that pay significantly more and there's people that pay significantly less. But the way that it breaks down is about 50 to 60% of regular retirees um, are paying uh, in the Medicare or are using Medicare and it's, it's government funded. Again, it's uh, when you, when you look at how Medicare breaks down, you have Medicare A, which is your Medicare coverage. Then you have your managed Medicare plans. I, I think they're called where you can get into a medical plan, so like a Kaiser or a Blue Shield or an Aetna or United Health or something like that. Uh, and the Part B plans are about $170, and, and they vary by state. So depending on where you live, I know, for example, some states have higher amounts than other states, but it's about $170, between $170 and $200 or something like that. And then you have Part D, I believe it is. Don't ask me what happened to the C. I don't know. But then you have Part D, which is the pre uh, prescription drugs. And so that's another 30 bucks a month. So you're looking out of the gate at about 200 bucks a month. Then you've got dental and, and some of those other items. But you got to remember, too, that you also are going to have out-of-pocket out of expenses because – and that's going to be about 12 to 15% of the spend because you're going to – as you age, you're going to have to go to the doctor more. So you may not go to the doctor a lot at 52. I don't go to the doctor often, as an example, at, at 52. But I – know that when I'm 65, 70, 75, I'll probably have to go to the doctor a lot more because as we age, our health declines and it's just kind of the way it is. Um, about 15 to 20% of folks are going through uh, private insurance and, and those are like Medicare gap plans and Medicare Advantage plans and so on. So again, that becomes, becomes more of the spend. And then for those that are low income, there's about 15 to 20% of the spend that go into Medicaid. And now some states are using Medicaid. States like California have what's called Medi-Cal. So our public health system within the state is slightly different than the federal system, but it's, it's all kind of about the same. But if you look at the percentage of your spend, again, a majority of it is majority of the cost goes into Medicare. Then you've got about 15 to 20 percent that are paying into Medicaid. And then you've got another 15 percent of that cost is is private insurance, whether it's your Medicare Advantage plan or whatever the case is, and then 12 to 15% is going to be your, your out-of-pocket expenses. But I know that most of us here that have questions aren't asking about what's my retirement going to be like or my retirement health care going to be like at 65. 
because we're in our 30s and our 40s and early 50s saying, I want to retire now. I want to get out of the rat race and I want to start living my best life in the best way I can without having to go into an employer and trade my time for money. And so I want to talk heavily about the early retiree um, benefits or health care. And those are, again, people that are younger than 65 and are not eligible for Medicare. And so, and, and these costs, and, and I want to warn you now that the costs get significantly higher because you're not subsidized by the government necessarily in, in Medicare. But when you're not retired, or I'm sorry, when you haven't reached full retirement age, you often rely on a mix of private insurance options like the Affordable Care Act, you've got COBRA coverage, and you've got out-of-pocket uh, expenses and payments that you, that you pay in. And, and I'll tell you that, again, I don't get political on this channel. It's not my thing. But I think to myself and wonder, there's a lot of people that probably would not be able to retire early if it wasn't for the exchanges. And as imperfect as they are, and I think the president at the time said that it's not a perfect system, but what it has done is it's created an option for a lot of people to get health care and not necessarily rely on a company. Um, and it, it makes me wonder how many people stayed with companies just to get that specific health care because they wouldn't get it someplace else. And I know that still happens now, but there's people that just need health care that don't have health care through work. And so what options did they have? But anyway... That's enough of that. But when you when you look at early retirees, I, I want to take a look at each of the different pieces. And I have some notes here. And I really want to break these down for you so you have a good understanding of, of what each of these entails. So first, we're going to talk about private insurance. Uh, the coverages are usually driven through the Affordable Care Act exchanges. And so you'll have... Um, you know, medical services. And what you'll essentially do in the exchange is you have bronze, silver, and gold plans. And you go into the exchange, and it's just like if you go to Geico or if you go to an insurance broker, an auto insurance broker, there's a bunch of different plans there. But the nice part about those plans is what you pay for the plans, there's an amount for the plans, but what you pay for them uh, may be subsidized um, based on your income. And so, it, but it's going to account for about 60 to 80% of your, um, of your healthcare spending before you reach retirement. Um, you know, when you look at the premiums, you can expect to pay about anywhere from about $6,500 to about $10,000 annually. I have a friend of mine who retired, he's 58 and, um, he went to the exchanges and I'll tell you where I am at the end of all of this, but I don't want to make it about me. I want to make it about the information. But I have a friend who's about 58. No, I'm sorry. He's 59 because he's having a birthday soon. He's turning 60. And he went to the exchanges. He just retired, was looking for options. And he wanted to go to the exchanges. And he did. And the exchanges were, I think, about $600 a month for him. And so that's about $7,200 a year, plus out-of-pockets and deductibles and, and cone payments and those types of things. And, and we'll talk about COBRA in a minute, but it was less expensive than COBRA. And I, I'll tell you why. And I'll give you the information that I source, but I'll also give you a little bit of insider information so you can understand why the Affordable Care Act exchanges are less expensive than COBRA. Um, but, you know, again, when you start looking at the total amount that you're going to pay, um, you're going to pay total with. Uh, you're going to have out-of-pocket maximums of, of eight to $10,000. So you're not going to pay more than that, which is, which is good, particularly for those of us that have to take prescription drugs, for those of us that have to go to the doctor often, for those of us with underlying medical conditions that require us to get care. So you figure you take, in his case, as an example, uh, you take the, the $7,200, and then you might have to pay for co-pays and deductibles if he's a heavy user, but it's significantly less than having to pay for it on your own. If you go on your own and try to get health care, it's going to be incredibly expensive. And in most cases, I know for myself, it would be, it would be cost prohibitive. Um, the next one I want to talk about is COBRA. And that's a, COBRA is a continuation of your employer-sponsored health plan. Now, you, you could get the employer-sponsored plan. So a lot of times when you get health care through an employer, you'll get your medical, dental, vision, all of that. And we're just talking about the medical care. 
but you get the medical care at a discounted cost. What generally will happen is that an employer will pay a certain amount of the premium and you as the employee will pay another amount of the percentage of the premium. So what's standard or what's, what's typical in, in a lot of organizations, at least some of the organizations that I've worked in in the past, is they might say, um, you know, Mr. Bob Dabalina, we're going we're gonna to pay 90% of your health care for you as the employee, but your dependents have to pay 65%. And so that's why you see a big jump from a single filer for healthcare to somebody who has multiple dependents. And do I like that scheme? No, because I think healthcare is a, should be a right, not a privilege. And I think if you if you don't create a scenario where people can get healthcare, they're going to find themselves in a situation where they're sick and they're in the public healthcare system, and that's going to come out of our tax dollars. And so I think if you are able to provide health care to people and people are able to get adequate health care, that heads off a bunch of things. That's why we do physicals every year. That's why we go and get preventative care. So that way we don't have the issues down the road. And so what happens in COBRA is because you separate with the company, not only do you have to pay the employee premium, you also pay the employer's premium. And there's generally a markup on that. And so, it's again, it's not uncommon. And, it, I just, and I want to reiterate that I had a long career as a human resources professional, and I've not only negotiated rates for health care plans, but I also understood the administration on the back end and understand that deeply, is you'll generally pay an administrative fee on top of it. So it's not uncommon to pay 105% of the plan premium. And so if, let's say, what that means is, let's say you're paying $100 a month. Let's say it's a 90-10. So you're paying $100 a month for insurance. You leave your job, and you want to get COBRA. Okay, you were paying $100 a month because they were 90-10. Well, now you're responsible for that $1,000 plus another 5%. So it's like 1050 or whatever 5% of 1000 is. Um, so now you've got to pay 1050 for the for for the care and so a lot of times what happens is people say i'm going to go on cobra then they get shell shocked when the bill comes and the other piece of that that i think is critically important is that cobra only lasts for a a, a certain period of of time and so cobra only lasts for 18 months and i think you can go up based on certain circumstances you can go up to like 29 months and and there's some extensions you could get on cobra that way but again, when you look at $1,000 a month, uh, let's say, let's round it to $1,000 a month, and then you're looking at, assuming you're not 60 years old and you pay significantly less, let's say you pay $400 a month, if you look at $400 a month versus $1,000 a month, that's a 60% savings. And so the, again, it, it goes back to the exchanges. And I, and I will tell you that when you look at benefit rates, people say, well, why is insurance so high? It's because they use certain factors. They use your medical history in a lot of cases. They use your age. They use your zip code. Um, and they use, sometimes they use the job that you're in to see if it's a high risk job. So that, those are what the actuaries use to uh, determine what the rate should be for certain healthcare plans. And plus, we just live in a time where healthcare is just expensive. Um, how do you, why is healthcare so expensive? I, I think there are some folks that believe there's this uh, conspiracy to, um, to, to, to gouge the consumer. I just think when you have doctors that are making three, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars a year, that money comes from somewhere. Just like if you pay an athlete a hundred million dollars, those tickets can't be ten dollars. They're going to be expensive because you got it, the money's got to come from somewhere. And so, uh, so that's the thing about that's the thing about Cobra. So I, so Cobra is a good short term solution if you're between jobs if something happens or as my buddy did he went on Cobra for the first month while he was sorting out his Affordable Care Act situation and then he got on the on the Affordable Care Act. Um, the next the next piece of the early retiree program are health care program subsidies and so. Uh, I talked about this a little bit, but when you look at the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, as an example, the you, depending on your income, you may pay less. So let's say they come back and they say $500 a month, $600 a month. 
Well, let's say you were making $10 a $10 an hour. Well, you're probably not going to have to pay that because the government will subsidize some of that. Um, and, and there's a bunch of other types of uh, health care premium subsidies. You may have worked for an employer that has retiree health, and that's not uncommon. And so you have uh, employers. And I would suggest that you take all this information, you digest it, you go back and you start asking some of the questions to better understand um, if that's if that's an option. Does your employer have a pension? And if so, do they have retiree health? Do they subsidize some of your health care? If you're in a union, does your union provide a group plan to the retirees? I know a lot of unions do. So it's a good question to ask. It's something that's not talked about a lot. But what happens is the subsidies can substantially uh, take down the cost of the plan. And you're always going to get better coverages at a more competitive price in a group plan than you are in an individual plan because you're leveraging the numbers of, of people in the plan. Uh, the, next, the next component, and I think you see where I'm going here, but the next component are the, are the health care spending accounts. Um, you could get a healthcare spending account, and healthcare spending accounts are really not designed to pay plan premiums, because you can only put in as an individual uh, forty-one. I think it's forty-one fifty a year in twenty twenty-four, or um, eighty-three hundred dollars a year for a family, and so th- that generally is not designed to cover the premiums. But what it does do is it 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 can it can pay for a lot of your out of, out of pocket expenses, and so. Uh, co-pays, deductibles, uh, prescriptions, um, out-of-network types of services. And, and I think you would be surprised at how many things are, are out of network. I've known people that had spouses that were in treatment and they were getting a treatment that was incredibly expensive that was out of network. And so instead of paying after-tax dollars for that, you could pay for it with pre-tax dollars. So again, take a look at a healthcare spending account, but don't retire thinking that you're going to use a healthcare spending account to uh, cover your health care because it's just not, it's not designed for that, nor is it going to be enough. Uh, the next component, and again, something to really take a look at is to take a look at your out-of-pocket expenses and, and particularly what are the uh, out-of-pocket maximums for the plan that you're getting and balance those based on whether you're a high user or a low user. Uh, so if, if you have chronic illness, for example, and you go to the doctor often because you have chronic conditions that you need to go back for, then you're going to be a higher user. So it's better in some cases to take the higher copayment and the lower uh, deductible or the higher copayment. So you might pay $40 every time you go to the doctor, but your out-of-pocket maximum might be lower. So you got to take a look at the entire picture. And there are people who make a living the helping broker those types of conversations to help you make the best choice for yourself. And I, and some of those, they don't charge you anything out of pocket. And some of those out of pocket maximums, they could be anywhere from three to about $7,000 a year, depending on the plan that you're on. So take a close look at that because the, the, the low monthly premium or the low copayment may not necessarily be the money saving option for you because I would rather pay, I would rather pay $24 or I'd rather pay $20 uh, five times than pay $10 20 times, you know, so it's, it's, and again, I don't know how the math works on that, but I think you get the idea. If you don't leave me a comment and I'll try to clarify that for you or give you some better math, but I would rather pay more in some circumstances. And again, it all comes down to what your circumstances are, but you, you have to take a look at that. And then one, one thing that's generally not covered that's that's incredibly important is your your long-term care insurance i think i've mentioned to you that my wife and i uh as part of our coaching with our financial advisor where we got long-term care insurance because going into a nursing home going into a long-term care facility those types of things are generally not covered through a regular insurance plan um and in fact uh one of the last hospitals that I was working with, a large hospital chain here in Northern California, I was re- responsible for negotiating the deal to divest the um, home health component or the long-term care component from the hospitals with the unions because it's just not something that was viable for this health system. And so my point being is that health systems are moving away from long-term care and long-term care is becoming its own thing, its own business. 
as it becomes its own business, it becomes insurable in a different mechanism than the way that it was insured maybe historically through through regular hospitals. And so, and I'm sure there's some plans that do cover long-term care, and if they do, that's great, but you also want to make sure that it's sufficient. Um, and you start looking at the average cost, and again, I don't have those here with me, but I know during my discussions, the average cost for long-term care were like $6,000 a month. And so, does your plan cover $6,000 a month, or does it give you $100 per incident that you're um, admitted to a long-term care facility. So, you know, those are the types of questions that you're going to want to ask just to make sure that you're that you're in the right place. And and the last thing I'll talk a little bit about is um you know, they have these programs out there where they're healthcare sharing programs. Sometimes they're with certain organizations, sometimes they're with churches, sometimes they're with but they're but they're community-based um, subsidy programs and you, you become part of the group plan with a subsidy because they might have a group of folks that, that come together. This came up in my research. I don't have any specific examples of this, but I want to let you know that I, I want to tell you about this because in the event that you belong to a church or an organization or a group or a union or something like that, uh, that doesn't necessarily have a plan, but maybe has a a sharing program where you can get in on a community-wide basis, it's something to take a look at. Um, you ask the question. If they say no, then at least you know that you asked. But I, I would hate for you not to ask um, and then find out that they had one and would have been able to save a bunch of, save a bunch of money. But when you, when you really look at health care for, for early retirees, you know, your, your options are fairly limited. Um, there's not, you could, you could pay out of pocket. You can go directly to the, uh, insurer. And I, I just would not, in this climate, I would not advise that because, uh, in my most recent position, as an example, I negotiated rates with some of the major carriers and we had to increase our benefit spend, healthcare benefits for our employer sponsored plan about 13%. Um, we did a good job of negotiating because the rest of the marketplace was about 15, 20%. And so, there's healthcare rates continue to go up as we deal with this inflationary pressure, as we deal with all the economic factors that are there, those costs are passed off to the consumer. And so when you go at it alone, a lot of times you find yourself in a difficult spot. And so the Affordable Care Act and the exchanges really do a nice job of helping you tie all those pieces together. Um, and again, when you look as an early retiree, about 60 to 80% of your of your healthcare costs are going to be tied up in private insurance, and so you want to manage the biggest piece of that the best that you can, in the most effective way you can. And I would rather pay five hundred dollars a month and get Cadillac coverage than get than pay a hundred dollars a month and just get catastrophic coverage and not be able to get preventative medicine and things like that, and hope that an emergency doesn't happen because it's those moments when you're hoping that an emergency doesn't happen. Guess what happens? An emergency happens. Um, you know, Cobra is a, is a piece that could bridge the gap. So you don't lose anything, you know, for about the first 18 months or, you know, maybe longer if you have an extenuating circumstance, but retirement isn't an extenuating circumstance. Retirement is going to last longer than 29 months. It's going to last longer than 18 months. And so you're going to have to find a long-term solution. Uh, you, you're going to spend about 10 to 15% on your out of pocket, um, expenses, just, um, prescriptions, deductibles, co-payments, things like that. And there's no way around it because if you if you get a zero co-payment plan, you're usually going to have um, a higher premium. So it's at the end of the day, it becomes a matter of what your usage is and what you're comfortable with and what fits into your budget. And so as you're putting together your budget, there's no way that you could put together your budget without putting in health care. And it's a matter of, it's not if you're going to pay for your health care, it's a matter of how you're going to do it and, and what makes the most sense for you. And um, then you look at your subsidies, and, and those are those can vary depending on on the circumstance. Um, so as as an early retiree, I mean, you really are looking at potentially spending between ten and twenty thousand dollars annually for for, <clears throat> for your health care. And I, I wish I had a better number for you. And and these are all all of this information is information that came to me from um, Fidelity. I, I did some research, and, and Fidelity pulled together these big. 
uh, data sets and and it's so it's it's there's averages and for some it's going to be less some it's going to be more because there's unique circumstances remember it's going to be your age your location your medical history and, and a couple of other factors that they use to, d- to develop your premiums but plan for the worst hope for the best um, now with that being said sometimes depending on your income and with the different subsidies that are out there it could drop to between five and ten thousand dollars so and 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 just think about I know that seems about like a lot of money, but a lot of us out there are working jobs where we're paying one hundred and fifty dollars a month, two hundred, uh, three hundred dollars a month, four hundred dollars a month through our employer. And so if you're looking at four hundred dollars a month, and then you're looking at four times twelve is forty eight hundred dollars a year. Plus you go to the doctor a few times a year, so you got some co payments in there, and you've got some deductibles, and you got you may not be that far off, so you might pay a little bit more. But you're not as far off as you might think you are as you're as you're putting together that plan. But you could put that plan together, um, and so try to figure out if you're eligible for subsidies. And so, and again, I told you, I'd tell you about my situation. Is that my uh, one of our uh, previous employers had an employee uh, employer health plan, and so what they did is they subsidized, and we are able to continue to be part of the group plan because the employer allows that for people that retire from the organization. So. That really was was a big deal because the two largest expenses in retirement, health care and housing. We got our housing squared away. We were able to move to a place with a better cost of living and our health care. We were able to get um, our health care subsidized to a previous employer. But just so you know, our health care still costs us about 600 a little over 600 bucks a month for two of us so it's not like we get subsidized health care and we don't pay anything but it's not as much as we would have paid had we gone out and got private insurance on our own outside of the exchanges and so you know i i can't i can't sugarcoat it folks the idea of retiree uh, of, of being early retired and and dealing with health care you know it's a cost it's it's a it, it costs money. It's it's and you could say I'm not going to do it, and then something happens, and then you end up in medical debt and have to go back to work. But when you look at the things that are important, I, I think what'll happen is when you when you retire, you start to limit those things that you think are important. Going out to these dinners with all these people from work, it's not that important. Having nice suits to show people that you have a nice suit isn't that important. Driving a nice car not that important because you're enjoying your life and you're, you're finding uh, you're finding your 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 peace in, in other ways. But the one thing I will say, and I thought I'd mention this, uh, and I, I know I mentioned this earlier, is that when you do retire early, you're paying those elevated costs for a period of time. And then once you hit 65, guess what? It's like you get a raise because then you go into Medicare. And instead of paying five, six, seven hundred dollars a month, you go down to paying two, two fifty a month with your with your Medicare uh, plan A, B, and and D plans, and so you go off into the sunset. So it's not the the silver cloud is not a forever thing, but it's something that in the short term that's you're paying yourself because it, when you retire, it's your health and your time; those become the most important assets for you, and you don't fully appreciate your time if your health isn't good and the thing is is you want your health to last as long as you can because once your health starts to decline a lot of times it's it's on its way down so on that note uh i I know this was a lot of information i know i went through a lot of stuff and and i and i know there's each of these topics as as normal have a really really deep 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 rich set of information behind them that i just didn't want to take you all the way through because I know that could be painful for a lot of folks. I know it would be painful for me, but I did want to answer the question that came from uh, Jack Jackson because I, I think that what's on a lot of people's minds is I've saved all this money and that's great, but what about what am I going to do about healthcare? And the beauty is is if you get a financial advisor, what you what what you'll find is is you'll have a total number. You'll be able to calculate the total number over the period of time that you're retired. And then you pay that monthly, but in the meantime, that money is invested making more money for you. So it's not like, let's say it's $100,000 over the next several years. Well, you're not paying $100,000 all at once. You're paying X amount every month. And so as you're paying on that monthly basis, when the market goes up, well, guess what? Now you've got four, five, six, seven months of premiums from one month of premiums that you have invested. So 
But it, it takes a minute. I, I've, I've mentioned before that I'm very uncomfortable with some of that stuff because I didn't come from a place where we had money and I don't always trust the markets. But I'm just I'm just here to tell you that it works and it's and I, I retired at 51 and haven't looked back and I spend my time doing doing YouTube and spending time with my wife. So, um, you know, I, I think I think it's it's more attainable than you think, but I think it's a matter of getting comfortable with the information and hopefully this information helped you uh, get comfortable. So again, I, I want to take a moment to uh, to thank Jack Jackson forty seven sixty eight for the great question. Um, you know, if, if you have any, if any of the rest of you have any questions out there, let me know. Send me the question, and I will um, do my best to answer that question. I, I have a, I have a saying that if I care enough about you to answer the question, it's always going to be the truth. And I, you are all my friends, and I owe it to you to tell the truth. I've got a group of people out there that I have a responsibility to give good information to. And I don't claim to know it all. I don't claim to be a financial advisor. Uh, I can't give financial advice, but I can give you the information that I've learned because at the end of the day, this is my way of uplifting the human condition in any way that I can. So on that note, if you, if you like the channel, if you found this helpful in any way, if you like additional content, please feel free to like and subscribe to the channel. And uh, I'll do my best to, 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 to put up an episode that addresses your, your concern. Um, but on that note, um, have a good rest of your day and I will talk to you soon.